so thank you. It's my first time in Israel and uh, it's been a great visit and it's a great conference. So I'm very pleased to be here talking to you. So uh, as Doran said, I'm going to be talking about uh, the development of AI and um, data science more generally in Python and uh, the sort of role that the language has taken up in this nation how we can actually extend its advantage in uh, this type of development because it really has become sort of the dominant or obvious choice for this important type of software and I think that actually there are some things that the community could be doing more to maximize this advantage and uh, to make development of these things even better. So, so first of all I'll, I'll start out by telling you a little bit about me. Um, so my background actually was not in computer science. I started out in linguistics and uh, then I went straight from uh, an undergraduate in linguistics to a PhD in computer science. Now in Australia actually in PhD programs we don't do any coursework so I've actually never taken a programming course um, but I've actually come to you know really appreciate software engineering and you know designing careful algorithms and careful implementations and uh, you know, through that, uh, I've ended up developing uh, this library, Spacey, which is uh, a natural language processing library that I developed with Ines Spontani as uh, a small two-person company, Explosion AI. So, and our experience developing that has really informed what I'm going to be talking to you about today. So, to give you a little bit about uh, Spacey, if you haven't heard of it, uh, Interestingly, it's actually the fastest natural language processing uh, library of any language. So not just among like Python languages, there are no faster C++ or Java libraries to do this. And in natural language processing, uh, speed is very important because we can't just rely on computers getting faster because the web actually gets bigger faster than computers get faster. So you know, the size of our job actually uh, gets larger and so the implementation and algorithms that we develop have to keep getting um, uh, more efficient. Otherwise, the uh, total running time of the things that we'd like to do uh, with reading the web or reading all of the information in Wikipedia or something will actually get longer rather than shorter. So it's really an application domain where efficiency is very important. And this sort of dynamic actually plays out a lot in data science and uh, things where there's, you know, the size of the data sets that we want to work with keeps getting larger and so we have to think about efficiency in order to really achieve the aims that we've set for ourselves and in order to develop good solutions. Uh, but at the same time developing uh, fast software is not always easy in Python and I think we've come to some interesting lessons from this. So the main thing that I think sets this apart and the main thing that I think has made this successful is that it was de designed from the start in Cypher. Uh, which is a language used for writing C extensions in Python. It wasn't, you know, I didn't sort of develop it in Python and then retrofit the efficiency afterwards. And I, I'm going to be arguing that actually that doesn't work terribly well and that it's both easier and better to design for performance up front for these things. Okay, so I'll, I'll start by giving you a quick outline of, you know, the argument that I'm going to lay out and uh, you know sort of give you the whole thing in brief before going back and uh, justifying the individual assertions. So uh, just quickly here's the, the sketch of what I'm going to be t um, talking about. So the first thing to the first point to make is that you know Python is actually really the dominant language in this niche. So I don't think that there are actually any other programming niches where Python is the number one obvious choice. Um, it's a good all-rounder language that has um, a good place in lots of other niches but it's actually really in data science and also scientific programming, which is a slightly different type of niche, that Python is really the number one obvious choice. And uh, I think this is a type of programming that's getting more and more popular and is a, you know, sort of an important type of development. And so as a community, I think Python should think a little bit about how it has come to this place uh, to you know, be the obvious choice of development to this type of software and what we can do to you know, basically extend that advantage and um, make sure that you know it's uh, it's as good as possible to be developing this type of software in Python. And one of the benefits of having you know, this sort of position of uh, Python as a language of data science and a language of machine learning is that uh, then when we go to do web development or other types of development in, in Python, uh, there's all of this great tooling available. And so I think that it's really actually a great benefit for the language that uh, it's come to this position. So I think it's sort of worth thinking about this. I also think that the lessons here about writing high performance code in this domain probably do actually generalize to lots of other types of development and that there's sort of more general to learn here. So the question, how did you know, Python come to dominate this? Well, I think in general, languages get to 
this sort of position by, uh, of prominence, in other words, they win, by being a good enough solution that's in the right place at the right time. So I think around 2004, when Python started really taking off in scientific pro, uh, computing and uh, in data science, Java and C++ really weren't productive enough. Um, I think the languages have gotten a lot better in this respect since, but certainly then they were, you know, it was pretty hard going writing, uh, you know, quick and dirty solutions in this and, you know, writing things that you could change quickly and adapt. Um, and at the same time, uh, I think C extensions were just, you know, harder and less obvious for Perl and Ruby. So as much as I think that Python, you know, pride, rightly prides itself for a lot of cleanliness in the language, a lot of, like, nice developer experience, I think that it's not actually probably what's most decisive. I think that uh, what was really decisive was that it was easy to write um, you know, something in a lower level language and link it in and have that almost all of the performance that you would get from that uh, while still uh, being able to work in a higher level language. So this is, I guess, the you know, slightly controversial claim that I want to make here, and that's that despite a lot of ambivalence in the Python community about the role of C extensions and this kind of long flirtation that the Python community has um, been having with just-in-time compilation and other solutions and trying as hard as it can to you know, avoid doing C extensions and avoid and do less of this. I actually think that this is an, has been an important part of Python's edge and it you know, will continue to be an important part of Python's edge and that uh, we can actually maximize um, these advantages and do, do more of them both as a community and as individual developers if we sort of understand, embrace, and accept that, you know, writing low-level performant code is actually um, productive and efficient use of time. So to, to sort of flesh this out a little bit and explain specifically about Scython, which I think is a good solution for this type of thing. So let me first of all get this point going so I can point the code. Um, okay, so on the left here you have really the sort of most obvious immediate thing that you would think of to do in order to apply this function that, you know, uh, uh, which happened, this sort of slightly arbitrary data transformation turns out to actually be a very common operation in neural networks. Um, so it's essentially just a low-pass filter. We clip values that are um, lower than zero to zero. So the first most obvious thing that you would do is just loop over um, uh, the items in the list and if they're lower than zero, set them to zero. Now, this turns out to perform terribly because um, and I think this is over a list of like, you know, 100 million items or uh, something like that, just to give you a sort of scale of the things. But this performs so badly that even if you're doing a lot of matrix algebra um, and, you know, a lot of heavy lifting elsewhere in your application, if you've, impl if you've implemented this trivial function in this way, this will noticeably slow down what you're doing. Um, and so this is a trap, right? So um, people quickly come to learn that, all right, if you're using NumPy, um, you have to be writing, say, one of these um, two things. And so, you know, is this one faster than this one? Well, ah, yeah, thanks. Um, you just end up with Ruby. Uh, yeah. So you end up accruing a, a lot of this sort of arbitrary wisdom about, you know, all oh, right, I will use this maximum function and add the x's. Yeah, this is, okay, I'll just go here. Oh, is this? Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, thanks. Yeah, so um, basically you end up learning a lot of library arcana um, in order to sort of use NumPy well and take advantage of its vectorization. Um, but instead of learning this slightly arbitrary things, if you simply use Scython, well, you get to write it basically in C. And the code that you end up writing for this actually ends up looking a lot like the obvious solution because you don't end up running into this sort of arbitrary artifact of the language where loops just happen to be slow. So this performs at the same speed as it would in C because it really just compiles directly into C code. So the sort of trivial to write obvious solution, uh, if you do it in Scython, ends up performing as well as you would want. And so you end up a lot less trapped into having to use the, li um, the arbitrary APIs of different libraries. And so you know, it happens that there are good solutions in NumPy for this, but A, you have to know what they are, and B, if you then have a problem where you need slightly different and uh, there isn't a solution in the library, well, then you're sort of stuck. And also, because the capabilities that are exposed in the library are sort of arbitrary, you en end up having to spend time figuring out whether there's a fast way to do this in NumPy. And what I want to suggest is actually that 
this whole thing of like, all right, now how do I do this in NumPy? How do I like, you know, work with the libraries to do this sort of thing? If it's really easy to express the logic as a function, then it's very, actually very handy to first just say, well, like, what's the problem? I'll just write it in this and I'll write it in Siphon and, you know, that'll be kind of like, you know, one of the first things that I go for, the first tool that I reach for. And I actually think that that's a sort of more productive and um, extensible type of solution for this type of problem rather than, you know, having to work around the limitations of the language and work through these libraries. Okay, so um, so as I said, this is what we should do differently. I do. I think that individual developers, um, it's beneficial if they, you know, get comfortable writing Cython and reach for it sooner, rather than um, spending more effort trying to learn work around this and learn more library uh, features and you know these sort of backdoor tricks about NumPy. Um, I think that you know, in general, uh, learning more Arcana about library about individual libraries doesn't pay you extra dividends. And so it's sort of, it's better to be working in domains where you can reason about um, your code and you know, have everything sort of make sense. Um, but at the same token, I think that the community should really invest more in making this type of solution easy and obvious. Because at the moment, it really isn't. And I think that we can do a lot more to make, um, to really fix that. And finally, I think that the general problem that this is attacking, performance, is generally a big problem in Python code. Uh, and I actually really don't think that we can fix this as an afterthought. I think that the discussion that's around, say, releasing global interpreter lock or um, improving the just-in-time compilation tools, I don't think that any of these will really solve the problem well. Because I think that in order to get uh, well-performing code, a lot of it comes down to making uh, programming decisions and then expressing those decisions in your program. And just-in-time compilation and things really don't give you a good framework to do that. Um, the decisions need to be made, they need to be made early, and then you need to write the rest of the program consistently with that. And this means that you can't, really can't do this as an afterthought. It does have to be a sort of upfront process. So to give you a sort of more complicated example of this, and this is, uh, um, this is not a real example. This is sort of still arbitrary because I wanted to have less code. I actually think that this is a little bit more code than I like having. But this is an example of, um, Sort of a more complicated thing that you can do with Cython. Um, and so this is really just, it, it really just is C++ that's just written in Pythonic syntax. Um, but the nice thing is that you have an easy linkage into the Python library. So if it, at any point of this, you wanted to say raise a Python error um, natively in a way that was useful to the um, program, you wouldn't think twice about doing that. Whereas if you had this actually in a C++ file, suddenly you ha you're across this language barrier. And you're no longer really developing a Python solution. And I think that that really makes a difference. So the, the free mixing that you get of um, C++ logic and uh, Python logic, I think, is really distinct in Cypher. And I think that that's really something that makes, sets this apart and makes this a, a useful strategy. What this example is doing is it's an example of, say, finding the top three ratings of a long list of things. And so the type of um, development process that I'm suggesting is really sitting down and saying, well, okay, if I've got this long set of ratings, how am I, what's the minimum amount of information that I need to actually encode that? So in this case, we've encoded it as a 64-bit integer for the user ID, a 64-bit integer for um, a product ID, and a floating point number for a score. And so uh, if we look at this, it's like, okay, this comes to 160 bits of memory. And this means that we can easily say that if we have one billion of these, this will take 20 gigabytes of memory. And so we say, all right, I've got a machine that can do that. Now, this is the type of sort of simple analysis that really ends up feeling cut off from you in Python. Um, I really don't know off the top of my head how much memory one million integer, a list of one million integers takes in Python. Um, it's just not something that I ever really think about. Um, whereas it's very easy to remember, well, OK, a one million 32-bit things takes four megabytes in memory. Cool, OK, like we can read. You can really start to reason about the size of working sets that you can actually um, use and what you can fit in one uh, machine or how you can exercise these calls. And so doing this type of sort of upfront reasoning feels like, oh, God, like, you know, I just wanted to solve my problem. Why do I have to, like, think about these things? But it actually doesn't take that long on the scale of, you know, development. Like, you sort of sit down and do this analysis and um, 
at the end of it, you end up with much, much less sort of experimental, like poking and prodding and like groping in the dark. And I think that overall, that's actually, um, it's much more productive. So for the rest of the example, I, you know, again, this is sort of not real, not a real example, but I thought, well, okay, you know, maybe we've got this long list of structs and um, we want to have, say, a priority queue to find a top three um, without sorting the whole list. And this type of thing is, you know, it's very easy and natural to express this logic and, um, uh, you know, essentially with C++ data structures. And at the end of it, we can very easily output a Python list. So this sort of natural, um, one of the, a neat feature in Cypher is that this will naturally convert the struct into a dictionary. So that we can just get a little Python dictionary of the top three items. And so when you sort of get practice in this, this is, becomes no slower to write than it would in Python. Um, but I find a lot, lot faster to write then you would if you were sat, sitting down and said, well, okay, I'll have a two-dimensional NumPy array and then num another NumPy array for the score. And just working with these flat buffers that you end up working with in uh, NumPy is really a much more limited type of programming than you would get if you, you know, basically just get to use structs and arbitrary data structures and things. Like, you know, working around the limitations of the language um, makes it very difficult. Whereas if you just say, well, you know, here's my memory and this is what I'm going, this is the algorithm that I'm going to express. I think that it's much, uh, much lower variance, much more reliable process once you get sort of, you know, more practiced at it. So, um, so that's the sort of vision that I have for like, you know, what I'm, that's the type of solution that I'm going to advocate for. So first I'm, I'll back up a little bit and, you know, justify a little bit of um, this assertion that Python's uh, currently the best language for AI. Um, so this is sort of a, a little bit of a straw poll um, that we did in uh, our sur a survey that we put together for um, uh, the users of space and also users of um, uh, related things and you know, basically general AI developers. And we found that, yes, people are very dominantly using Python. And so this was very biased because you know, it interacts with our developer uh, community and we are a Python library. But it, it does match up with, A, the sort of like common wisdom in, um, that's around and also the um, developer surveys that you see in Stack Overflow and other things, where um, Python very clearly comes out as the number one um, language that people are talking about in this sort of space. And um, so the, as a sort of further straw poll about you know, why that might be, um, so this was just a Quora thread and you know, somebody asked why is Python the, um, uh, the leading language for this stuff. And really the, um, the answers that kept coming back were the ecosystem. So it's you know, basically that there's um, more uh, libraries developed for this, and so more developers working in it, and then this creates this virtuous feedback loop of more, uh, you know, more and more of the same, basically. There's, you know, because it's the, the obvious language that people are working in, it's also the language that people develop libraries for. OK. So the question then is, you know, how did we get to this point? Like, why is the ecosystem better? And what, something that's notable about all of the eco, all of this ecosystem of performant good um, data science tools is that they're all basically C extensions. And in fact, sci, they're pretty much all written in Scythe. So Pandas, um, uh, it's basically Scikit-learn, um, a bunch of NumPy is C because it was written a long time ago, but then other bits are also in Scythe. And it's really the part that's kind of making this whole thing tick. Um, so you know, one of the only exceptions is that TensorFlow was um, bindings are in Swig. Uh, and the core library is in uh, C++. And I actually think that this, you know, it sort of gives this notable different feel to TensorFlow, where you're really cut off from the internals um, as a Python developer. Whereas if you're using one of these other libraries where the internals are in Cypher, it feels much more ex accessible that you can basically go in and use the lower level API. And the lower level API is sort of set up for you to use as well. Okay. So, um, if we, so how do people normally do, like, you know, um, what's the normal approach to writing more performant Python code? I think that the, the following sort of process is very common. You start off by, you know, basically implementing the solution and getting it to work. And you test it and you're like, great, I've got an implementation, I've got my prototype there. So then you sort of start to fiddle and you make it a bit faster. So there's always something that you've done with, um, you know, your NumPy arrays or um, something. You know, there's some way that you're using these libraries that is on idea. And so you profile and you tune and you make it a bit faster. And then at the end of it, you say, well, OK, if you're not happy with the results at the end of um, point two, then you start to look around a little bit. You say, well, I 
here that numbers a thing like PyPy, Pi, you know, and so basically you start, you know, sort of more desperately trying different things. Um, and then, you know, you might say, well, okay, I need to parallelize this, I'll add more cores. So then, you know, this may or may not work. Um, Multiprocessing doesn't is not guaranteed to give good results because uh, you may lose so much in the um, pickling and startup um, and transfer costs of the multiprocessing that you actually can't easily benefit from it. Um, and once you're at this sort of point, um, the trap's sort of set. Um, you're kind of in a local maximum here, and that's that's really the problem that I think comes up a lot. And I think that it's you know sort of worth avoiding. Um, so I think it's you know basically the path that the, the language sets out for us and also that the community sets out for us, this is really, I think, the recommended process. And I think very often it leads to an, an outcome that is very difficult to fix and a lot of time has been spent to get to this point where we're not happy with the performance and we've spent a lot of time developing this thing and we don't really have a good way forward. And I think that that's really the problem that I you know, want to talk about and um, see whether and advocate a solution for. So this is the way, this is kind of a metaphor of this problem. And I call it the parable of the tree kangaroo. Now, this noble Australian animal is, as you may notice, a kangaroo that lives in tree. And this is sort of a strange outcome if you think about it. Um, because, uh, you know, Australia is being an island continent was cut off from uh, most of the rest of the world for a long time. And so it kind of developed its own line of kooky mammals. So the ancestors of kangaroos were sort of possum-like creatures that lived in trees. Then at some point there was a job opening on the ground and um, kangaroos developed and they're essentially kind of like marsupial deer. They occupy the same sort of e ecological niche as deer do in other parts of the world. But they're, you know, they have a lot of interesting ad adaptations for that sort of grassland living. But then at some point a job, op a job opening up uh, back up in the trees in the rainforest environment. And so then, you know, the kangaroo said, well, you know, I'll take it. And so you end up with this animal that is actually by the scale of evolved animals, kind of quite ill suited to the work that it's doing. We're used to thinking of uh, evolution as producing these exquisite adaptations and, you know, um, animals perfectly adapted to their niche. But actually, you know, evolution's a hill climbing process. And so there's no guarantee that that's going to happen. Um, you may end up with this sort of weird path dependent local maximum of a kangaroo living in a tree. So, and, you know, if you watch these creatures, you notice that actually they really are, you know, quite ungainly. And you can say, you know, nice things like, well, it's surprisingly good at climbing for a kangaroo. And they do have, you know, a lot of adaptations to this. They have, you know, big claws. And actually one of their notable adaptations is that, you know, their legs, which are built for jumping, mean that they can push in the blow of falls quite well. And so, you know, they are surprisingly good at falling out of trees and surviving. But this isn't a great outcome, right? Like, you know, once you're in this position, you're like, well, it's hard to feel like there wasn't a better solution if you started off in a different part of the solution space. And so the parable of the tree kangaroo is really about how the incremental changes to a solution do not necessarily get you the best solution. Um, you do have to, like, sort of make sure that you're in a good part of the solution space to start with. And I think that this really applies to optimizing code. Um, you can't expect that if you just take an existing solution and sort of incrementally optimize it, that you'll end up with a program that is good. You may end up having to rewrite the whole program. So, as I said, you can incremental improvements just don't always lead to the best solution. You can make your program, you can reliably make your Python program faster bit by bit, but eventually the bits get smaller and the effort to make those optimizations get harder. And the changes that you have to make to your code make it less and less readable and less and less maintainable. Similarly, kangaroos can indeed get better at climbing or falling out of trees, better bit by bit. But you know, this doesn't um, this doesn't actually lead to a satisfying outcome. So, as I said, then ultimately you can see this by you know the incremental solution isn't always competitive. Now, it just so happens that there are no apes or uh, orangutans in Australia, you know, we have, I guess, import restrictions. But if you can see that the solution here is unideal by very easily imagining how quickly they would be outcompeted as soon as that were no longer true. Like as soon as there was an invasive species somewhere, then, you know, okay, you know, the tree kangaroo would very quickly find that it was like not competitive with a different, um, something that came up from a different part of the solution space. So what I suggest is a better sort of approach to Python or a better um, uh, 
solution for this is that we should, uh, you should actually get used to planning your data structures up front. Um, it feels like effort at first, and indeed, you know, it's not this sort of greedy path, but the fact that these local maximums exist, you know, should make, you, make your peace with that and say that, well, actually, if I just do at each point what seems like, you know, the step that takes me one little bit closer to my solution, you won't necessarily end up with a, a, a better or easier time overall. And so there are these situations where the upfront analysis is actually very efficient. Um, and then once you're doing this, you're really in a domain where you can reason about things. And that makes things more reliable. And so then you can write the simple, obvious, and approximately optimal solution. Uh, but there's also, there are problems here. And that's why I say that there's, you know, we can make this even better. Because unfortunately, step three is, well, now I have to chant strange incantations into setup tools because I have some compile error and things like, I'm like, why is this so hard? And why is the documentation not that great? And like, wait, isn't this, is this the way I'm supposed to do it or am I doing it wrong? Or like, you know, why is this so hard? And so, but eventually you do benefit greatly. So my, you know, my sort of humble vision is that, well, okay, I'd like to suggest that this could be better. So I think that actually in order to make this better, um, it would be nice if just sort of on a messaging level that this, it was sort of more obvious from people or there was a sort of consensus that this was the accepted answer of how to do things. And I think that that's really not the case at the moment. I think actually the setup tool stocks at the moment reference something called Pyrex, which was you know, the predecessor of Cypher. Um, and then there's you know, mixed messaging about when you should use CFFI, CFFI or when you should do this or that. It's, you know, it's very confusing. And I've met a lot of Python developers who've actually never even heard of this, even though it really powers most of the libraries that they're using. Um, so, you know, I think we should discuss some way of like, you know, solving this and some way of making this a more obvious um, uh, direct solution. Um, I don't want to comment about what should be done here because I don't, honestly, I don't know enough about that. I'm not a C Python developer. I don't know what solutions are appropriate or something. But it does seem like there may be something that could be done that makes this sort of a more official, obvious choice. And, you know, hopefully there's something there. So then, um, there's also a lot of improvements that we could get from just sort of extending this strategy. So in AI at the moment, um, pretty much everybody's writing CUDA code, which is, um, you know, this dialect of C that can only be compiled by NVIDIA's compilers, um, and it, you know, basically is how you get your thing to run on the GPU. Now, we write this as strings in our Python code, and like, this is obviously unideal. We're just like writing this chunk of programming language in a string, and then I can't even compile it on my um, home machine. I have to like send it off to you know the server in order to get my compiler. Um, you know, and in the meantime, I'm happily writing this language that compiles into C, and the semantics of CUDA are no more difficult than the semantics of um, the uh, C++ code that I'm compiling with Cypher. I should even actually be able to have the same function and target different backends of it. So I'd, again, I don't know exactly the parameters of the solution that I'm that I want here, but it really feels like something could be improved from this. And so I'd, I'd love to see more investment in this. Um, uh, similarly, I think that there's kind of a two-tailed trap at the moment. So when I started designing Spacey and I was a happy Cypher user for a long time, I imagined having this elaborate, well-documented Cypher API to the library. So there would be this kind of lower-level backend that people could hook into. But the truth is that there was never like a scary of demand for this. Um, and so it was never really developed. And so even though I use the Cypher API a lot, it's kind of like not really obvious to people. And I think that you know, this is because libraries don't tend to make this available, and so developers don't, aren't in the habit of asking it or expecting it, and so libraries don't make it available. Um, so I think if we kind of get over that, um, then I think that the development process could be a lot better, because it could mean that instead of people having to wonder, well, which one of these ways of using this thing in Spacey is going to happen to perform better, if they need the more performance, then they can just write the obvious thing that obviously is going to be optimal because it, you can actually reason about this rather than having to guess how it's implemented internally and which one's going to result in more object allocations in Python, which there's just no way to guess. You just have to happen to know. And I think that having a, if we can get to a point where there's just fewer things that you have to happen to know, I think that that's going to be a lot better for the community. Um, similarly, actually, I think that it could be a lot easier to develop standalone libraries and applications. So at the moment, there's this problem that I'm sort of writing C++ level code, but if somebody actually wants to use that from C++, there's a lot of song and dance that they have to do. And it's 
in theory possible, but this could really be a lot easier. And at the moment, one of the um, real disadvantages of writing Siphon as opposed to writing um, C++ is that it's a lot easier to write to link C++ into other languages. And I think that you know, if that continues to be the case, we'll get more applications that are written in native C++, and I think that that'll actually be worse for the Python community, because it will be harder to use those things as from Python, and they'll feel less like Python applications. They'll feel much more like a C++ application with a thin, kind of ugly Python interface, um, which is much less good. Okay, now to sort of head off a couple of objections that I think I see from this is, you know, sometimes there's a sort of narrow conception of the role that people have as a data scientist at the moment. And they say, well, look, I don't really need to worry about performance because I'm you know, basically just working in data science and then I'm going to hand off my code to uh, some engineer and they're going to implement the production level um, version of this. And so, I don't re so you know, the perception of this is that I don't need to worry about performance. Somebody else will worry about that. And you know, my response to this, which come across as latest, is I Personally, if that were my I wouldn't be so satisfied with that because, you know, it really means that you're pa painting yourself into a corner where you've got kind of an unstable situation. And, uh, you know, if you're not interested in writing the sort of production level um, version of this, I suggest that the people who are, who, you know, you're throwing your solution over to the fence, the fence to is like the implementation monkey, I think that he's going to be eyeing your job and saying, like, well, you know, there's you know, why can't I design a neural network? Well, actually, I think I, I can. And, you know, I think that the um, the sort of, you know, division of labor that uh, is in the market at the moment is, you know, I wouldn't keep betting on that uh, continuing. And um, I also think that even from this, you know, aside from that sort of cold calculation, um, I think that in general, in development, um, there's a sort of trend towards people having T-shaped skills, um, which is this idea of having a deep specialization and then also a broad knowledge of um, the other roles that you're interacting with. So I think it's, prob it's both unhealthy and inefficient to have the attitude of something else being not your job and you don't need to know much about it. Um, I think that you get much better at any one of these roles if you understand well um, the concerns of the other people who are doing the other roles. And if you could sort of wear that hat um, if you had to, and maybe you're less practiced at it, but I think that drawing a, a boundary box around the things that you know and are good at and saying, well, this is, these are my skills and I'm going to work on them is not very healthy. I think that in general having the attitude of like, well, you know, I want to know all about the whole process um, leads people to develop better solutions and get better at the things that, you know, even if they care about a, deep, a particular speciality, I think you'll do better at it if you understand more about the rest of the way that it's interactive. So I would suggest that even if you are currently in a role where um, you do hand off to production engineers, I think that you should be interested in continuing to understand how those production, like the concerns that make the production implementation fast and how you might uh, do more to make that easier and not have to rewrite um, whole chunks of solution after they're done. So another thing that comes up often is people say, well, Look, this whole process of sort of you know worrying about these low-level details. Why can't I just write in a high-level language and um, have these details sort of taken care of for me? You know, it seems like a simple transformation to um, you know unbox these integers and uh, as I as it's iterating through them. This is all very mechanical. The pro the computer should do the engineer's work of rewriting these things, and I should just work in a high-level language. So, the problem here is that. A lot of the benefits flow from um, making decisions. And actually, it's the making decisions part that people are sort of recoiling from. The part that feels hard is this planning part. But that's also the part where the benefits come. So you know, unless your program just happens to have the, these consistencies that the just-in-time compiler can take advantage of, you really won't get much benefit from this. So, and instead of just sort of planning to have those and sort of remembering to enforce them, it's actually really a lot easier and more intuitive to sort of write them in at the start. So if you're going to decide that uh, this you know, list of items is going to be homogenous by type, um, which is really what you need uh, in order to take advantage of just-in-time compilation, you really may as well specify that in the data structure that you define, rather than just having it as this sort of loose constraint that you follow. Um, so I, I really think that um, rather than having the just-in-time compilation as kind of the first plan, and having you know this fallback strategy of ah oh, if we get desperate we can write it in C, 
I actually think that we should flip that. And where just-in-time compilation really shines is in situations where we can't do anything else. So when we've got a whole chunk of code and we don't have any control over this code base, we, you know, it just comes to us and we're like, well, we want this to run faster and we can't rewrite the whole thing because that's too expensive. So at least, the, at least we can use a just-in-time compiler and then we get this benefit. And that benefit can come for free and that's like really awesome. But if we are in control of the situation and we do get to make decisions and we haven't written the code yet, then the first point of call should not be the just-in-time compilation. At that point when we have the decision to make, I think that it's actually better to plan out the application's performance and um, you know, plan to have uh, internals of it uh, in a memory managed language and plan out data. Okay, and similarly, another thing that you know, may come up is, well, you know, why do, all, why do many developers have to worry about that? Why can't this be sort of a narrow concern of library authors? And then you know, we'll have these sort of bottlenecks that are written in um, uh, you know, this fast style, and the rest of us can you know, not worry about this and sort of write in higher level semantics. And the thing is, this is, you know, this is sort of almost true. This has been what's made Python successful, and this strategy is really working. So this is kind of like, you know, 90%. Like, I wouldn't say that people should, you know, write C uh, too much. But the thing is, if you really have this as um, your, like, only strategy, and you don't have any access to these underlying fundamentals, then you become very dependent on these library solutions. And you end up spending a lot of time sort of trying to figure out how to, like, tune the performance of the library and how to, you know, all right, if I do it this way, is it slightly faster versus doing it this way, is it slightly faster? Or, spending more and more time hunting down other libraries to do different things and, you know, is this poorly documented chunk of code better than this other poorly ch documented chunk of code? And a lot of the time when you're doing that, the logic that you're trying to express is really simple. And so rather than hunting around for some existing solution, you can just write a few functions. And I think that that's a much more powerful and, you know, a strategy that pays much more dividends overall. Because instead of learning, you know, really arbitrary stuff, um, you can you know, basically have more control of reasoning about your programs. And I think that that, in the long term, is you know, a much more beneficial thing. I just think that at the moment we're in this situation where the path to that sort of greater long-term benefit sort of travels through this like, you know, valley of um, you know, ch chanting incantations and set of tools and like, being confused about stuff. And that's you know, basically making that path to you know, getting to a more sustainable point, I think, is, you know, what I think we can improve. And so that's what I wanted to suggest here. So, thank you. Okay, so the question is, if we're going to worry about, you know, divining low-level memory uh, stuff, then you know, why use Python at all? Why not use a, a language that's sort of more defined, designed for that and a language which actually does have a lot of advantages for that type of development? And so this is true to some extent, but the fact is that um, Python is a lot to give up and a lot of the time you actually really want to interact with the rest of a Python code base and there's other reasons why you do want to continue with the language. Um, so if you are working within a larger um, project that um, has a reason to be in Python, then you may still be developing a, um, a trunk of code that by itself wants to be performant. And so imagine that your company overall is using Python, but you've got a task that you know, is you know, some development goal that's six months or, or something of work. You still may want to have that in Python because you know, having it as a service is inconvenient and you want it to be a library. You want, you want to take advantage of other Python tooling. Um, so you know, there are lots of reasons why you want to continue working in Python. Um, and is, but you know, doing this is not so bad. So if you sort of make peace with the, you know, these things which are still slightly unideal about Python, um, it's still a good way to do this. And you know, you can still basically get this done. And I think that in that pretty common sort of use case, uh, you're better off ma managing the memory rather than uh, you know saying, well, I'll give up entirely and write it and go. Um, so you know, there are situations where you want a performant library that is easy to call from, top, from Python. So the question is that I, I seem to be favoring rewriting over patching. And I actually think that whether, whether this is rewriting or not depends on whether you've written it in the first place. So uh, I'm actually suggesting that you don't even necessarily need to rewrite. Um, you know, I'm suggesting that at the start of a project, if you know that you'd want to, say, 
process a bunch of you know these product ratings. You know, rather than thinking, well, uh, that seems like something that I'll need lots of machines for. So you know, actually sitting down and analysing how much memory something will take and saying, oh, actually, no, that'll fit in memory um, if I use this data structure. Um, that upfront analysis, even before you've written, um, can save you from having to rewrite. Um, and I think that that's actually something that um, you know is, can be very beneficial. Um, so the question is whether I could um, sort of talk about the comparison or like you know the dynamic of people using NumPy versus people using Scython. So first of all, I would say that actually I don't see it as two communities at all. Like I would say that um, uh, NumPy support is built very heavily into Scython, and almost everybody who's using Scython is also using NumPy. Um, and actually, I think vice versa. There's a sort of level of detail that which people who are using NumPy sort of end up reaching for NumPy. And um, people who are using Scython end up reaching for NumPy. So Pandas, for instance, is written largely in Scython, but it certainly has deep linkages into NumPy and um, the rest of the PyData ecosystem. So the way that I see it is that um, the um, I think that the NumPy developer um, community would be the first to say that the library itself has really evolved a lot over time, and there's a lot of concern for backwards compatibility, um, which means that there's a lot of sort of arbitrary details in the library that make it not perfect. And you know, I remember there was one uh, a thread that I uh, read on GitHub about you know making the random number generator faster in NumPy and using a faster algorithm. But and the decision was actually that we can't improve this because we want stability in actual the num the random numbers generated because otherwise we'll break too much scientific code and people will get like a totally different analysis. And so, if you think about that level of sort of history in the thing, it's a pretty troubling position because I actually think that that decision was correct that okay they shouldn't improve the random number generator, but it also you know makes me dismayed because I want a fast faster random number generator right. So. I think that there's a lot of things that you end up doing where the ob the sort of like best way of doing it in NumPy is a pretty approximate solution, and uh, you know rather than having a lot of guesswork and writing code that's actually not very readable, it's often a better alternative to um, just write in a memory managed way and sort of think more carefully about the structure of the thing um, rather than you know sort of muddling along in NumPy, which actually doesn't give you much support for this type of development. So I definitely feel like it lets me uh, manage the low level details, yes. So I do think about cache performance. Um, I find that the C that uh, Scython generates is overall very good. And it's very, also very easy to um, view the C that um, is being generated by looking at uh, the output. Um, if you use, um, but sort of one of the tricks that I use to make that true is I really do work with pointers a lot and also with C++ data structures a lot. If you work with NumPy arrays and memory views, then there's a lot more like of an art to this because you kind of are working through the, the Python layer. Whereas I've sort of made peace with, well, I've got this chunk of memory and I, I will use this. So, but once you're doing that, it's no harder to make sure that your memory stays aligned at cache boundaries and stuff than um, you know, it is in other uh, languages. Um, then also in terms of debugging, um, I find that actually the Scython compiler is pretty useful at catching errors, um, so I and I get you know sort of nicer errors out of it than I uh, would from uh, like just writing in C. Um, I have to say that I don't tend to use a debugger very much. I tend to sort of you know print things, um, and I found that actually also in Scython that works pretty well. And I get to use PyTest and the rest of the Python testing infrastructure very na naturally and easily, um, which is something that. Uh, you know, I've never quite gotten comfy when I've tried to write a you know just strict C++ code base.